It is five and we are live and that is no jive. Do you hear me talking to you? I'm talking to all of you. It's time for some break on through. And as you can see, I got me a special guest here today. It's a man that deserves no introduction. But as you know, when break on through, I always give an introduction. Because you'll be, I'll have you some bitches going, hey, who the hell is that beside you, Jeff Clayton? Damn, you got to tell me something. So I'm going to tell you something right now. From Taped Fist. Maybe you saw him at the 35th anniversary where they about stole the damn show because of this son of a bitch right here. Um, super fan, super anti-scene fan, super wrestling fan. And we're going to touch on all that today. My good pal, Mr. Mondo Braswell. Welcome to Break On Through, brother. It's my pleasure. <laughs> so, man, you're a North Carolinian now. Yes. After being... I am a, uh, a official hick. I've been waiting my whole life for the official stamp. I am a hickory North Carolina native. That's all right, man. And uh, it's been pretty good so far. I've been there two months. Been taking in all the sights and sounds, eateries and other things. And uh, been going pretty good. I can see I've got some technical troubles here. I'm going to try to fix them. You keep talking. Everybody hear you. But uh, yeah, it's been pretty good. It's been one of my goals in life for the past uh, 20 years to uh, get off work and... Uh, Take a light drive to go see uh, my favorite band, and I did that Friday. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll talk about that. Yeah, we got. Yeah. I see Benoit is here. He he was there Friday. He took a little bit of a longer drive than you did from Hickory. He drove from Canada. <laughs> so what? <laughs> so what? You didn't move here, did you? <laughs> nope. Nope. All right, well, Mondo. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna talk about. I'm, I'm gonna go back to some. Like, okay, let, let me ask you first. What came first for you, wrestling or rock and roll? The two things you love the most in the world. Both. They both happened simultaneously. Same. My earliest memories of anything is hanging out in the early, uh, well, late seventies, because mm -hmm. I was born in seventy five, mm -hmm. but. Some of my latest memories are 78, 79, hanging out at the uh, house, 10 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, mama cleaning in the house, listening to disco hits, volume <laughs> 20 probably at the time. <laughs> and dad, dad in the makeshift living room, I say makeshift because our house was, we had a living room, kitchen, and bedroom all, all in one, connected to the a porch out front. Mm -hmm. But... Grandparents were into wrestling. Dad was into wrestling. My dad was uh, big into music. 60s, he was into like stuff like, uh, I was going to say the Yardbirds. Not the, the Tamarine Man. Uh, not the Birds. The bird, the Birds Birds, not the Yardbirds. But he was big into that stuff. And when his friends were going into like uh, getting into Black Sabbath and stuff, mm -hmm. heavier stuff, he went. He went this way, and he started getting the soul stuff. He was a mm. Sam Sam Cooke guy. Mm -hmm. He was a Smokey Robinson guy. But plus, he liked you know Southern rock, and you know we had you know AM Gold blaring in the background, right. and you know Dad hanging out watching wrestling on TV. So it really happened right at the same you know right at the same time. So rather rather than going the route of a lot of young people, you. You embraced your surroundings, oh, as opposed to yeah. uh, kind of revolting against them. You know, some people, oh, that's what my dad liked, and that's what my mom and dad were. Listening. I don't listen to that kind of stuff. You know, I hear that a lot from people. Right. Uh, hell, I hear that from my own kids. A bit. <laughs> but so your parents are listening to the to the good stuff. It's the late seventies. It's the early eighties. <clears throat> And you're watching wrestling. What? What is the match? What is the? Can, can you remember the match or either the wrestler that got you hooked? That you that you said, "I'm going to watch this every time it's on." Well, the thing that changed changed my life. Being in, uh, I was in South Georgia. 
I just moved here from Macon, but we lived in like Cordell, which was uh, about two hours south from Macon. Uh -huh. And we would get Georgia Championship Wrestling, but more importantly, we would get like a subsidiary of Georgia Championship Wrestling. So we would get Macon, uh, Macon City Wrestling or Macon hmm. Championship Wrestling. Okay. But the two wrestlers and the feud of the freaking century lifetime that changed my life was Wildfire Tommy Rich mm -hmm. and Mad Dog Buzz Sawyer feud. Mm -hmm. That was... That was the main thing. Then you had your other people coming in, like Dusty Rhodes and Jimmy Valiant, stuff like that. Um, Rip Rock, actually, uh, it was weird because I was like, I was a face guy. I was into the good guys. But then you have people like T uh, Ted Oates and Rip Rogers, who were, uh, at that time, the early 80s, the uh, Hollywood Blondes. Mm -hmm. I would like them kind of guys, too. Mm -hmm. But to answer, really answer your question, Tommy Wildfire Rich, Mad Dog Buzz Sawyer. Um, my first live wrestling event that I went to in 82, the main event, which the whole card was just crazy. First two opening matches was, first match was Brad Armstrong versus Moondog Rex. Mm -hmm. The second match was Tito Santana versus Mad Dog Spot, <laughs> or Moondog Spot. Mm -hmm. And then the main event was Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff and Wildfire Charming Rich versus... The Russian Bear, Ivan Koloff, and Mad Dog Buzz Sawyer. Man, that, that Dude, is a hell of a man. card, man. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it was wild, man, because it was TV in front of you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like an old, dirty high school gymnasium, but, you know, these guys that I saw that that morning, a couple hours later, I drove down the street, and they were right in front of right. me. It was, it was wild. Have man. you ever had the opportunity to meet Tommy Rich? Oh, is that a story? Oh, man. <laughs> See, I'm a diehard wrestling fan, and also I'm a PK. I'm a preacher's kid. So I have gone to church and met Tommy Rich more times than I want to. Mm. <laughs> Believe me. Yeah, I've met... Oh, geez. He's probably, the, he's probably the one dude I've met the most, especially within the past, like, 10 or 15 years because I like going to independent things in Georgia and also going to conventions. He's always, always there, and... He he's he's cool, or or as he or uh, Ricky Morton was uh, would say he's pretty cool. <laughs> he's pretty cool. He'd be like, "Hey man, what's going on, brother? How you been doing, man? I hadn't seen you in a long time." Five minutes later, "Hey brother, how you doing, man? I hadn't seen you in a long time." <laughs> so, <coughs> you mean as opposed to like ten minutes ago? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But yeah, man, Wildfire, I've met, yeah, there's a ton, There's a handful of wrestlers I've met a sh crap ton of times. He's definitely one I've met 50 times, maybe even more than that, between like, you know, conventions and like shows and stuff right, like right. that. Pardon me. <coughs> hey man, do what you got to do. Drink, have, drink you some break on through brew right there. That'll, that'll do you right. That'll get your mind right in the right spot. Well, man, you've, uh, <clears throat> like, I think when I first met you, it was over wrestling, right? Like, isn't that what got us talking? Yeah, well, technically, the first time we were in the same vicinity was 2003, Nine Lives, Lena GA, Little Five Points, and I went there to see... Is that see place still there? Nah, uh -huh. dude, it's one of those... Hoity toity, like hipster, like type bars. And that place was like cool back in the day. You probably hear this all the time. I know you guys in North Carolina hear this about the milestone. But Nine Lives was the CBGBs of the South. That place was great. Perfect, perfect rock and roll bar. It just kind of went to shit like everything else. <coughs> I, I, I know the times we played there, I, I really loved the stage and the PA in there. Oh, yeah, it was great. And the, the sound guy uh, looked like Pig Champion from, uh, <laughs> he was like, he was like literally like the best sound guy and the biggest sound guy of all time. He weighed like 600 pounds. But yeah, me and some of my friends went there to see the Murder Junkies and you were singing for the Murder Junkies. Okay. And uh, along, around that time, around 2000, I'm kind of a, kind of a late bloomer, but around 2000 is when I started getting to Gigi Allen, started getting to you mm -hmm. guys. And then... A couple of years, several three years later, we heard about you know the, I guess it would be the tenth anniversary tour. 
so we went there and you know i hung out and talked with merle and stuff and i saw you sitting by yourself and i'm like man do i really want to go over there and talk to talk them <laughs> because you know <laughs> it's not like you have a like a uh I don't even know the word. I was going to say, I can't even say the word right, but when you meet Jeff, there's kind of a little bit of a warming up period. Um, but I just had to break the ice. I was like, man, I'm either going to go talk to him or I'm not going to, this is not going to happen at all, no matter how intimidated I was. So me and my friends were uh, talking, shout out little John Hines. He was the guy who got actually got me into a scene. So Hey, little bro. John, what's it going, man? But uh, I was like, man, let's go get over there and do it. Let's go over there. And you, you know what? Talking to talking to Jeff, especially talking to him for the first time, I was not prepared for it. And I don't mean in like an inti like intimidation factor, but I walked up to him and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna walk up to him. And he likes wrestling, and I like wrestling, so we're gonna ask, I'm gonna ask him this and this and that. And I was like, uh, so like, hey man, can I talk to you here for a second? And he just looked at me and went, yeah. <laughs> And I was like, I just wanted to know who's your favorite wrestler. And he was like, well, depends on what kind of wrestling you're talking about. Are you talking about the golden age of wrestling? Are you talking about hardcore wrestling? Are you talking about ultraviolet wrestling? Because we could be here all night, son. <laughs> and I was just like, wow! Did we just come best friends? Yeah! <laughs> My main man, Dale Elmore, just asked what year Gigi died. That would have been 1993, Dale. The year Eat More Possum came out. Yeah. I don't know what month it came out. Well, I know y'all did that uh, Y'all did that talk show, What's Cool with, mm. for Me or whatever. Yeah, What's Cool with Me. And y'all were talking about doing the benefit show to get us... Uh, In New York. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you were talking about the new album that was coming out, mm. Eat More Possum. But for all you uh, weirdo diehards like me, actually on that uh, talk show, it wasn't Eat More Possum. It was Eat More Possum. <laughs> because <laughs> they just got finished playing. I think you might have got like a hair in your mouth or something like that. You're like, Eat More Possum. More Possum. <laughs> got some possum around possum here. Possum meat. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right, so that's when we first met then. Nine Lives, Atlanta, around 2000. What? 2003. 2003. Well, that was a long time ago. It don't sound like a long time ago, but when you consider it is now 2022. That's wild, man. Almost 20 years ago. Right. That's wild. And then the first time I actually <clears throat> saw you guys play was, you remember Mulligan's? Yeah, in Atlanta. I tried to think of the name of that place the yeah. other day. Home of the Ham Dog. Yeah, I was I was telling my wife about this. I I forgot the name, but it was uh, it was uh, they they would deep fry sandwiches like whole sandwiches, like batter them up and deep fry the son of a bitch. And I I didn't dare try it not before we played. I figured you know it would be a G.G. Allen show, <laughs> right? If I did that, but yeah, I, I remember that show. That's the only time we ever played there, and it wasn't even in Atlanta proper. It was, uh, it was, uh, what's that little town? It starts with a D. I want to say the soda, <laughs> the cater, the cater. Yeah, it was the cater. Um, but yeah, that was man. But that was the first time I actually like saw you guys guys play, and then in between that, a couple, a couple of months afterwards. <clears throat> Or around that time is when my first, my first like serious band, Pier Six, started. Oh yeah, Pier Six Brawlers. Yeah, we, we played with y'all a few times. Yeah, and then you actually came to see us at uh, the Star Bar. Mm -hmm. So then after that, we wound up playing with you guys at Drunken Unicorn. Right. Yeah, that Drunken Unicorn was a drunken mess, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we were yeah. having fun, but let me let me tell you, any any of y'all that know. Know this guy right here. Um, when he does shows, when he tells you that he doesn't like to play with more than three bands, including his band, he means it. So when we played that show, there was four bands, and I know my buddy and pal 
was doing us a favor by letting us be on the band. But listen, the show started with us and ended with them. And in between that, it was just kind of whatever. Nothing on the bands because the, spy, the, uh, the spies played and they were cool. And another mm. band played too. But yeah, it was, uh, it was a weird vibe, most definitely. But we had a good time there. <laughs> what was the vibe about? I, I just remember it being kind of off. Uh, people, <clears throat> and this is just from my perspective, people were, see, if you're not from Atlanta, you're not from not from Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And we lived an hour away, and we might as well, we might, might as well, well live on the West Coast. Yeah, we yeah. might as well live in Canada. That's how we got, mm -hmm. we, we got treated. I mean, there's a couple of people that really, really took us in. Dug us. They were in, in for it for the right, you know, the right mm -hmm. thing. They wanted to, you know, be cool with each other, play music, you know, be friends or whatever. But a lot of us, we were just redheaded step stepchild, yeah. and they were they were n not thrilled with us playing that show or playing mm -hmm. any sh really any show in Atlanta until so we found our own little like our own little gr own little group. But uh. But yeah, man. Man, it's like Atlanta has always been weird to us. Mm -hmm. Always. I mean, we've had, you know, I've, I've talked about that infamous show at Dottie's that got us banned from there for the better part of a decade. And uh, mm -hmm. we used to play a place called the Midtown Music Hall where we had some really good shows there. Right. But we played the Masquerade, uh, we played the Claremont Lounge. We played just about everywhere you could play back then. And uh, uh, Atlanta always kind of gave us a cold shoulder. Um, we had, a, we had a, a, a group of fans that were diehards. You know, you would, you would show up to some of these and, you know, later. But, uh, yeah, Atlanta always had a weird... I used to, think, I used to say it was always uh, people in Atlanta acting like they're from New York. You know, just standing in the back looking cool. Right. But can't be uh, phased by anything. <laughs> That's what I used to notice anyway. But uh, well, some of those people too, they'll be your uh, they'll be your first uh, best friend when you walk in the front door, and when you walk out the back door, they'll be you know shit talking you and stuff like that. I know that from being in a band, but I also know that from being a being a fan, where I would go, to especially especially anti-scene shows because people would show up there and be like, oh, I love your band and blah, 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 blah. And the next minute, they're out in the parking lot talking shit. <laughs> or two weeks later, they're at another band show and they're doing the same, you know, same exact thing. Or you have those guys that are... The, the, the cute ones are the... The cute ones to me are the ones that actually play in, like, bands, too. Mm -hmm. They'll come up and, like, they'll play their, they'll play their set... And, you know, afterwards they'll get, like, super drunk, and they'll come up to you, and they'll, like, tell you the same thing, like, five five times in a row. Or, uh, one instance, this probably happened more than one time, but one time I was at a show in Atlanta, and a guy walked up to you and, uh, said, said, hey, guys, I can't wait to, man, this is my first anti-sheen show, I can't wait to see you guys, when are you guys going on? Man, we just played 15 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> there was this one dude who played, I can't remember the name of the band he played in, but it was like an Atlanta, Atlanta band. And this dude literally came up to you 10 times during the night saying the exact same thing. The exact... <clears throat> I was trying to think. This is an Adam Sandler movie. Maybe it's like 50 First Dates and there's a guy... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with a 10 second memory and I literally this is the same dude because he would walk up and he'd be like man I love I love your band and this is my favorite song and blah 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 he told you that like 10 times man I get that a lot I get that more than my fair share man right matter of fact when uh, after uh, the lockdowns mm -hmm. and we started playing again I got that one night and uh, it seriously made me consider whether I wanted us to be a band that played live anymore right I was just like, God damn, I can't take this, man. Right. It's like Groundhog Day every two or every 15 minutes. I'm just right. Like, yeah, sometimes I can get get pretty fed up. <laughs> right. But, uh, <clears throat> man, 
uh, uh, for the people that don't know, uh, this guy right here is one of the most entertaining, energetic front men that you will ever see. And I'm telling you, when when you when when we had him play with us at the 35th anniversary show four something years ago, I guess four years ago, man, uh, they were they were an opening band. It was them and uh, Joe Cephas and the George Jonestown Massacre, and. Uh, I have to say that real slow too. Yeah, I, I, I can't say that. <laughs> but, uh, but man, this guy is like, and I, I told a buddy of mine this: whoever gets this guy to be their front man in Charlotte, they're gonna have a hell of a front man. And I'm saying that I'm I'm putting you over, and but but it's true. I'm not just putting him over; it's true. When you hear my words. You know that those are the words of truth, and that's what I'm talking about with this guy right here. Um, well, your your other group was Pier Six Brawlers, yeah, right, and they were fucking awesome. But I think I like Tape Fist better. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> I think that Tape Fist had a. Uh, it was a little bit more of what we were going for mm -hmm. with Pier Six. Interesting story. Before we even played our first show. We were going to be a total, a total ripoff of anti scene. <laughs> same, same pace or whatever. My drummer in the band, my lifelong friend Dirty Dan Lott, was playing <clears> drums. <throat> He's a talented guitar player. He decided he wanted to play play drums. The first show we played, all our practices before everything was kind of like mid, mid tempo. We were mid-tempo for like two seconds. And he realized, one, how hot it was in the place that we were playing. Two, he realized the faster he played, the quicker the show <laughs> would, be would <laughs> end. So we went from having a set that was probably like, our set was probably maybe like 25 minutes. We played that set in 13 freaking minutes. <laughs> We've done shit like that before. Right, right. We said, man, let's get out of here. All well, right? that time... Let's just play it fast. Well, not, well, not too long ago. Well, I guess a couple of years ago, y'all uh, played with uh, y'all played with a negative approach at... Uh, it was a negative approach at I Hate God at uh, at Ground Zero. And y'all played mm -hmm. 10... So, play, that's when Bowman filled in for, uh, for Barry. Mm -hmm. And I think y'all played 10 songs. And, dude, that set was like 12 minutes. <laughs> I was just like, wow, it's already over. <laughs> I wish more opening groups would do that. All right. But uh, I don't even remember the original question, but yeah. I don't either. They're right. right. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. My main, main, Mondo Braswell, he, you know, he knows what to do when you come to break on through. You come bearing gifts. Look at that. From 1975. Y'all know who that is. <clears throat> you know that old JC likes this kind of stuff. So thank you, Mondo. I appreciate well, it, man. What uh, what month is that? September. September. September seventy-five. <clears throat> I was a month and eight days old. Hmm. I was uh, what seventy-three, seventy-three. I was. I was twelve. That's wild, man. I was twelve years old. Even more wilder than that. Let me borrow this for a second. When uh, Mr. Allman and uh, Miss Cher were doing this uh, cover across town in Macon, Georgia, my mom was recovering from having the most beautiful baby of all time. <laughs> I don't like to brag, but there's never a lag. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what gave you the idea to mix wrestling with your music. Because, I mean, I, I, I'll tell you where, where, where I got the idea. And and you got the idea from us? It's 100% you. I tell, like, <clears throat> um, you know, I've been, mentioned, mentioned before how I, I, like, I was kind of like a late bloomer as far as, like, anti-scene concerns, sort of like the band around 2000. Well, my whole world changed, and people will say this, and I'm, I'm the same way. My whole world changed when I first uh, heard Gigi Allen. Mm -hmm. When I first heard Gigi Allen, it gave me, you know, I was into a lot of punk, 
Ramones, big into like Joey Ramone, D.D. Ramone's writing, also big into, uh, don't hold it against me, Glenn Danzig's writing with uh, Salon and with the uh, uh, Misfits. And I would listen to that stuff, and I would just like, okay, whatever. Well, when I heard Gigi Allen, I was like, maybe I can like all these weird words and all these weird phrases I'm coming up with. Maybe I can like do my own thing singing. So I, I tell people that Gigi Allen gave me a new vehicle, but you, my friend, you are the one who taught me how to drive that vehicle <laughs> because I had all these well, thoughts. Man, I in my, that. Well, I, really I had do. all these thoughts in my head and I'll listen to you, uh, listen to your, uh, y'all's <clears> records, <throat> especially like listen, listening to, uh, Eat More Possum with uh, Cactus Jack. And I was like, it's been laying right here in front of me the whole time. I don't have to write about dragons and wizards. And I don't have to worry about, like, you know, all the, the chicks I want to bag. <laughs> I'm going to write about the truth. I'm going to write about wrestling. I'm going to write about eating. I'm going to write about not bagging chicks. I'm going to write about <laughs> finally bagging chicks. And then, if I could say that, bagging chicks. Mm -hmm. getting, in, getting in relationships with the girls and them going to complete shit. <laughs> I can write about that shit all day long. Which has been, which is a, uh, a attribute. It, it can be a fault at sometimes because I'm hard hard headed. Um, but yeah, I write I write what I want to, and there's two people who taught me that I can write what I want to. One being Mr. Jeff Clayton right here, also B A from Sloppy Seconds. Mm -hmm. Y'all the first people, and then when I started <laughs> listening to Sloppy Seconds, I was like. Well, you know, if I'm going too gung ho on the on the on the wrestling thing, maybe I can, you know, if I want to write, write about Captain Kangaroo, I can write about Captain Kangaroo. If I want to write about my, one of my favorite sodas, Tahitian Treat, and why I rather drink Tahitian Treat than go out uh, hang out with the boys on a Friday night, I could do that. <laughs> Man, I'm gonna tell you what. Here's the thing. I, I'll have members in the band sometimes say, well, we've never done nothing like that before, or we, we, we can't do that. I'm like, uh, who the hell <laughs> who the hell do you think we are? Uh, we can't do that? Or, I don't know. I, I'm looking for the anti-scene rule book that says we got to, you know what? I wrote that rule book, and guess what? It don't exist. I wrote it, and I threw it away. Throw the rule book out the window. Right. You know? <clears throat> so... Yeah, you do whatever you want to do, man. That that's what that's what the, the the beauty of all this punk rock was to me. Right. When I discovered it, the fact that the rule book was out the window. Right. You know, you could do whatever the hell you wanted to, and then you know, a lot of groups took a path that I was not interested in whatsoever, and um, and you know, I, and I guess around that time I started we started just forging our own path. Right. And. Uh, I have been very fortunate over the almost four decades now to have people like Mondo playing in fantastic bands come up and give their testimonials about how we or I somehow uh, influenced them. And man, that is, that is always a great, great compliment. And I, and I appreciate it. I really do. And... Uh, <clears throat> so we dis we discussed wrestling. We discussed your tie-in with anti-scene. What's next on the agenda for Mondo Braswell? Well, I uh, you moved to Hickory. I moved to Hickory, um, working at the uh, local mall, slinging T-shirts for the American public. Um, a lot of people. Uh, for this reason or that reason, do not like the place I work, <clears throat> but I work for Hot Topic. I have been working at Hot Topic for a long time. They're a great company to work for, and plus I can uh, almost... First Lady's here. Hello. Hmm. I can almost show up to work every day almost looking like Jeff Clayton. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And it's it's cool, but you know, just just uh, working. Um, I you know I moved to moved to Hickory. The uh, the adult reason is you know 
professionally my job, but I've also moved here to be closer to my friends. I've been here, uh, came here to be uh, a little bit closer to some uh, wrestling events that I've uh, missed. There's lots around here. Right? And uh, I've also moved uh, North Carolina be closer to these guys. Everybody in the band, everybody associated with the band. Um, all the, you know, my brothers and sisters that I've been, you know, fortunate to connect with over the years because of anti singing to live here. We can hang out. Mm -hmm. It's a good bunch of people. Not too shabby. Not too shabby there. But, um, but yeah, that's, <clears throat> that, that's it for me. And, uh, if you have a, uh, if you have a uh, blue Ed Gang Jurassic anywhere, and just let me know. Oh yeah, this guy collects some <laughs> anti scene records now. <sighs> but um, man, I guess uh, you know, I know a little bit about what may be on the horizon for Mondo Brownsville. See, I know rock and roll secrets that no human ear has ever ever heard, that no human eye has ever seen. Now you're going, Jeff Clayton, you got that from the Cosmic Commander, but I'm telling you, it's true. I know these things I see, I hear, and I have the low down in town. And you're gonna hear but you're gonna be hearing more from bon Mondo Braswell. Not just when old JC brings him here on Break On Through. So stay tuned for that. And um I, I don't know if you saw my post I made on Facebook yesterday. About, uh, we will be going on a slight hiatus, but never fear. That does not mean we will not be busy. It just means we, um, we have to tend to some other things. I'll go ahead and lay this on you. I'm sure Malcolm will tell you when he goes through it. But Malcolm is getting surgery on his wrist, and he's going to require uh, quite a bit of time for some recovery. And, um... <clears throat> So, we're going to be doing a lot of stuff in the studio. There's going to be lots of um, lots of stuff coming out. I mean, pretty soon here, it's going to be like they pulled the damn cork out of the anti scene release dam, and it's going to be. It is going. To, I mean, I'm telling you, this it's starting to trickle in, and pretty soon I'll be able to give you all the lowdown. And you, everyone will know. There's other stuff going on in the anti-scene world that I'm going to hip you all to at a later date. I'm not going to talk about it today. Uh, next week, I'll be flying solo again. And uh, we'll have some top tens. and all that. I should have had you do a top ten. But I didn't know what to do a top ten of. That, like, I, I've explained it to people. Sometimes these shows are on the fly. And even though we planned this, it was still kind of on the fly. I gave them the address this morning. So... Uh, you know, next week I'll have some top tens. The week after that, um, I'm going to have the legendary George South will be right here in the Break On Through Studios. Can you dig that? Do you know what I'm talking about? You you know that I can. All right. Well, man, <clears throat> um, anything else you want to talk about? Anybody got any questions for Mondo? Come on, lay something on it. Has anyone got a blue drastic? David Lynch, is that Mad Dog David Lynch? Asking about my spoiler shirt? That's David Lynch. Yes, sir. We were talking about David Lynch. David Lynch is the guy that trained me in the ring for the short time that I uh, spent there. I was his manager. Rip Carnage. Man, we didn't, we didn't, uh, okay, yeah, that's him. Hey, David, how you doing, pal? Good to see you here. Um, we didn't, uh, we didn't operate too long, but what we did, we did some memorable things, and, uh, and I am very happy, I'm, I'm happy he showed up today, and we were just talking about him, what, 45 hour, hour ago? Yes, sir. Asking about that, but, um. I have, I have one question. What's that? Do you... Or Dave still have the silver bone? My daughter Carrie has that. Does she? Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. Yep. Somebody was asking me who my uh, favorite uh, wrestler is. 
it would probably change day from day to day. But if I did a top five, Dusty Rhodes would always be on there. <clears throat> Cactus Jack would always be on there. And um, Bruiser Brody would also be on there. But you can ask Jeff, too. I'm a big enhancement guy. So the Duke of Dorchester would also be on there. <laughs> <laughs> sh sh hey, hey uh, sh share the break on through audience your Dusty Rhodes tattoo. Look at live that. Live in Technicolor, baby. Hanging out here, Facebook Live on Mondo's <laughs> Elbow in public. If you will, in Charlotte, North Carolina, a queen city, but ain't no pity. <laughs> we having a good he time. He actually has a time, photo baby. of Dusty yeah. pointing at this thing. <laughs> That's fucking awesome, man. <laughs> so there's this dude, and I'm sure you guys out there in Facebook land have seen it. There's this New York guy that has been doing a, a, a fat. Polka dot Dusty mm -hmm. impersonation. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, he actually uh, he got a he, he was able to get a photo with Dust Dust too, but he actually did this thing with Cody uh, at a yeah. House Cody show. Rhodes introduced him as the American Dream yeah, and something, man. didn't he? Yeah, that was, that was the cool. people drive me, baby. <laughs> Wait, elbow is the best place for a Dusty tattoo. That is correct. My, well, my main you, main Randy Ream says that. Nice. Well, I'll give you. I'll give it a little tattoo shop talk, too. I wanted to actually be actually, like, on my el elbow, but the guy who did my tattoo would say, man, it would look, look way better and less interference if you had right there. There's a guy I know that works with big-time wrestling. His name's Jimmy James. He actually has a uh, polka dot elbow pad tattoo, which is <laughs> wild-looking. Well, Mondo... I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here on Break On Through. Right on, man. It's been my pleasure, as I said. Um, the reason I said pleasure the way I did earlier, mm -hmm. uh, was it, uh, the guy from San Francisco, was it Dennis Berkeley? What, what character did he play? <sighs> I don't know, but he was, in, he was in the movie Mask. He was... Uh, he was Bulldozer in the movie Mask, but he also played Theo in the oh, Son of Law. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know who you're talking about now. But yeah, the yeah, son of, yeah. But yeah, but then the Son of Law, he was he, he, uh, some, uh, the dad or whatever asked if he would uh, if he would show uh, if he would show uh, Polly Shore around. It was like it'd be my pleasure. <laughs> so I say that every time, like daily. <laughs> Yeah, all these pop culture references, man. Right. They, they fly all over the place in the Break On Through studios. Yeah, man. You got to watch your head. We are a wild and untamed thing. That's right. <laughs> we cannot be chained. Nope. Well, you listen here. I appreciate each and every one of you being here today. I appreciate you every week. And for you that couldn't be with us live and are watching on replay tonight, we appreciate you for tuning in. And I'll see you all of you next week. Mondo, it's been my pleasure, brother. Thank yes, you, sir. Thank Likewise. you so much. One more week is all you got to wait through, and then it'll be time once again for us. To break on through. <laughs>